What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. If I ever find a little bastard of business, a dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're engaged, and we like to get scared together. <laughs> Ooh, we're in such comfy sweaters for this episode. Oh, yeah, I got to fluff out my beard. Oh, yeah. Got to give myself a lighthouse beard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy, Triton's beard. This is what went uh, in d and d a few episodes ago. In the early part of the episode, Beth was like, oh, God, James is here with a crazy crazy beard this is what i was doing yeah i was just fluffing it all out it looks nice yeah <laughs> it's very yeah it's very willem dafoe in this movie ha! <laughs> <laughs> all right so the lighthouse released 2019 yeah oscar nominated yeah as of what that was monday uh yeah for cinematography, sure, which we'll it take deserves, it. and it deserves so many other awards because it's fantastic. Poor Defoe. I know, Willem Defoe. And really, even our paths, man. He's, yeah, for real. They both, both are so good in this movie. Uh, I think straight up our review about this is going to be all over the damn place. Oh, yeah. This is going to be less of a beat-by-beat beat review, more of an just overall our thoughts on it. I mm-hmm. think because this it's... movie is not one that makes sense to review in a linear fashion. Yeah, I don't it's think... not really a linear movie. It's just kind of uh, almost slice of life of these two dudes going crazy on this rock. And which one's crazy? Are they both? I don't yeah. know. And like, I think the thing that's neat about this movie is like okay you can you you often hear the complaint that like you know why why can't people just make horror that's horror and that's you know what that doesn't need to be saying anything we don't need to be making horror political we can just make a scary movie that's just a scary movie and that can be done well and i think this movie's doing it Oh, sure. This has nothing. uh, This has no social messages or anything. I mean, I think it has undertones. Yeah. I saw someone tweeted us about how gay it is. It's very homoerotic. It's got some homoerotic. (laughs) Yeah. Like you could watch it and be oblivious to it. Sure. But but also (laughs) Eggers has even said. Oh, has he? I think both the actors have said too that that's definitely there. I mean, actually, you'd have to be closing your eyes pretty hard they, they come real they close to kissing kiss, yeah and you just want it <laughs> yeah they're actually so i have a bunch of notes here thank you christian one of our mods man unprompted so cool. i didn't even ask he just had a whole like document of notes about this movie and was like here you go he put part of the because you can read the script online oh and he put part of the that's the thing okay so we saw this movie in theaters and then yes. uh we just rewatched it on it's available for streaming right now yeah uh holy shit totally different experience when yes. you have captions because in the theater i still enjoyed it but it was definitely a thing where like you know 10 or 15 minutes in, I was like, I don't think I don't I'm going to be able to follow what this. what they're saying, yeah. I'm just going to let it happen. But it actually does have more of a story, kind of. Yeah. It's easier to understand when you can read what they're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was happy, like, watching it with captions, I was really happy to realize, okay, I didn't miss as much as I thought I did. Because even if you don't understand what they're saying, you kind of just you, get you it from get context. It. And what's like, happening. The thing with this movie is... You just got to go on the ride. <laughs> yeah. Like if you, you know, if you decide to watch this before listening to our review of it. Which you should. Which you should. Uh, but if you decide to watch it and you're like, uh-oh, I'm getting confused. Am I supposed to Am know? Am I missing something? Am I missing stuff? No. Just let it. And <laughs> that is by design both. Uh, so Robert Eggers and his brother who he writes with have oh, said that's it's, right. it's purposely there's a lot left ambiguous and they're you know what's truth what's lies i think everyone's gonna have their own interpretation of this movie and i don't think there's a correct one Mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure that uh even the actors were like so what is my character uh (laughs) like what's my (laughs) backstory and eggers is like you just kind of have to feel that out for yourself and whatever you decide is 
your character's story, then that's your character's story. It's, you know, it's pretty up in the air. Yeah, and this is Robert Eggers is the uh, co-writer and director, and he d- did The Witch was yes. his previous uh, debut feature and film, which uh, I don't know, he's around somewhere, but we didn't cover it on the podcast, but I gave it an extensive kill count coverage, and uh, I think I did a good job sharing. I'm concerned I can't find him. Honey, it's fine. He's probably just hanging out in the uh, uh, butter tray in the fridge. Oh, no. Living deliciously. Let him live his best life. I do have my black Philip Funko Pop, though. There you go. So, But yes, Robert Eggers, if you watch The Kill Count, you know that they shot oh, I the witch. <laughs> I thought you were saying, Robert Eggers, if you watch The Kill Count, oh. and then you were talking. I was like, maybe Robert Eggers. Maybe. We just had Radio Silence, whose episode <gasps> comes out true. next week. They watched we The Kill Count. We just recorded um, an episode with Radio Silence. They fucking made Ready or Not, which yeah. is one of our favorites ever they at were this sitting point. here hours ago in our apartment they were so cool were like normally coolest, when we have a guest or you know standard we record for an hour but yeah. we recorded with them for almost an hour and a half i think we could have talked more yeah so that'll be next That's week make sure week. you catch that yeah, out so look forward to it. uh but anyway robert eggers if you watched the witch kill count you would know that he you know shot it all with natural lighting uh <sighs> you know and Ooh, they tried that to be Kubrick, as- that barry linden style <laughs> Try to be as period accurate as possible. They even had like historians who watched the movie and were like, that is the most accurate depiction of that time oh, so I've ever seen in a movie. Same thing here. Lighthouse it doesn't go as far back into the past because uh, the witch is like 1600s, I believe, 17th yes. century. Yeah. Whereas the lighthouse, 1890s. Yes. And uh, shot on location in Nova Scotia, Canada. Oh, it looks cold and wet. It looks very cold. I don't know how much you read about the production. I, read I a imagine bit, yeah. it had to have been cold, miserable. wet, and miserable. I was reading one interview with Robert Eggers where he said that a lot of the crew that they worked with, they film. It's like local crew. They they film everything up there, and they often are filming like, um, I don't want to say like History Channel type stuff, but it's stuff that takes place there it's like maritime shit and it's all these shoots are cold and wet and miserable and he said they came out of this one and were like holy fuck (laughs) and they do this all they do this for a living but this shoot was uniquely miserable and not miserable in terms of the people yeah um robert eggers uh, uh, from what i hear is amazing to work with i haven't heard a bad thing about him um I know Willem Dafoe is coming is working with him on something else now. What the Viking thing? I don't think the Viking thing. I think he just or he's at least said he wants to work with okay. him and other stuff. But Anya Taylor Joy from The Witch too and she like all the out. all the actors really like Eggers. Um it's just the conditions of this shoot were terrible. I but- read a really gross little fun fact about the shoot too, is they Apparently, there was a scene that was deleted where they had, like, a food fight. Like, they were just throwing food at each other. And, like, because they're just trashing the set, I think they're shooting it so that they don't really have to clean it up or anything. So, they're shooting this food fight. There's just fucking gross food everywhere. And they said it smelled so bad. Oh, God. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, man. I know. And they, I guess, the, like, fucking, just to add to everything... The scene which should have gotten Defoe his Oscar nomination where he's like in the fucking ground and is getting dirt tossed on him by Robert Pattinson. While monologuing. He's and monologuing. Going dirt is mouth. going in his <laughs> nose and in his mouth. And he is also apparently laying in like frigid ice water. Like the bottom of that hole was wet and like... God. They said that was, I think, the second or third day of shooting, too. You know what? It. Good. Get it out of the way. Yeah. You don't want to do that at the end of a 30-day shoot. Yeah. hmm Yeah. Uh, yeah. But this is um, a less accessible film than The Witch, which may, you know, if you're just into the more mainstream stuff, you may find that hard to believe because uh, The Witch, you know, they speak in that old-timey dialect. Mm-hmm. It maybe moves slow for some people. I I find that a hard criticism I, to believe but i've heard yeah. it a lot it's it's a slow burn sure but the atmosphere is so good that that works it doesn't, yeah it's not but boring. the lighthouse is black and white four three it is not no, taking it's, out it's the whole one frame point, of your oh. i forget what the fucking it's like 1.3 i think to one so okay. it's a square it's it's a square it's silent film 
ratio aspect, aspect ratio, ratio yeah. yeah it's you know willem defoe growling his his lyric it, it's uh i almost said lyrics almost it's like how um what's his name in the witch uh oh Ralph Innocent. Yeah, how Innocent's got that rough, gruff voice. Here it is again with Defoe, mm-hmm. and once again they're speaking not as old timey, but now you got all this sailor jargon in there. Yes, which and, and like turns a phrase that you just probably have never heard before. It's I fucking love it, man. Yeah, and that too. They similar to the witch where there's like a little uh like a title card i forget maybe at the end of the the very uh it's at the end of the witch and then at like post credits in the lighthouse i mean yeah herman melville like Mm -hmm. moby dick a lot of melville the other person credited is sarah orne jewett who she was like an author from the period who was interviewing like captains sailors farmers and then writing their dialect down and stuff so they used a lot of her work too. I love it. It adds so much character. And then you got Robert Pattinson in this like kind of I can't tell if his like, accent is drifting. It's like an east he's... I think it's just like an east coast. I ain't never intended to be no housewife nor slave in taking this job. And it ain't right. These lodges is more ramshackle than any shanty boys camp I ever seen. Yeah, but I can't tell if it goes in and out or if he just doesn't talk that much. And then it like, it's or maybe startling, it's more yeah. pronounced when he gets louder, like near the end of the film. Because for the first half of the film, he's not saying that much. Right. You know, I mean, he says he's he's not much for talking, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's mostly Willem Dafoe just fucking talking at him and harassing him. Yeah. So the story, as much as there is one, is these two lighthouse dudes arrive on a small rock of an island that just has a lighthouse and a fucking nonstop foghorn blowing Mm -hmm. and they're supposed to be there for what four weeks four weeks yeah so a month shouldn't be that bad right right but then of course like shit just wilds out man yeah i guess that this is and there's been a few things based on this like true event but this is also kind of based on it um specifically the fact that they they're two dudes with the same name Mm -hmm. there was uh, i think it's like the smalls lighthouse there was this lighthouse around the same time period i think maybe a little earlier where these two dudes named thomas (laughs) were working uh same kind of shift and the one guy died and i don't i forget if he like if he murdered him i don't know if he murdered him but it was like something who knows what actually fucking went down but he the other guy who lived took this dude's body and put it in like a makeshift kind of coffin and tied it up to like the outside of the lighthouse. And then what happened was the coffin just is like is deteriorating over time. And this dude's fucking dead arm is like hitting the window. Uh, and so this guy's going crazy and it's like, oh, fuck, he's coming back to get me. Well, maybe he's trying to get inside. Maybe go bury him a little further away it, than you right can't, outside. This, you're on a fucking rock, dude. Put him in the ocean. I guess burial That's what at what Willem sea. Dafoe maybe did to yeah. his other second. If, yeah. Ugh. Who knows? Yeah, because Willem Dafoe's character, who is introduced uh, as Thomas, at least by the subtitles, and then later he says it himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, Thomas, what's his last name? He is Thomas, Thomas Wake. Lake. Wake, Wake. And then Robert Pattinson is- Ephraim uh, Winslow. Ephraim Winslow. And yeah, so he's the newbie. He used to be- uh, a logger up in the Hudson Bay Company, yeah. which can't imagine at that time how cold and fucking miserable fucking just wilderness that would be. It probably still is right now. I was trying to think of what job I would rather have. Like if I a would logger, I rather be a logger or, or a like, wiki. I think a wiki for yeah. sure. I guess. Because a logger, I mean, I can't imagine the ways, just the many, many ways you could mutilate yourself being a logger back that's then. That's true. And I guess with the if you're a lighthouse operator, you have a building to stay in. I don't know what those loggers are doing back then. Yeah. In the 1890s. Also, if anyone happens to, because like, we get a lot of fans from around the world, which is fucking awesome. If anyone's like up in northern Canada, let us know, or like the Hudson Bay area. Because that's always fascinated me when I've looked at maps, is that giant fucking bay up there. Yeah. And it's just like <laughs> just driftwood ice land masses going up to like Greenland. And yeah. it's just like, what is going on up there? That's a whole other 
way of life I'm not familiar with at all. Yeah. Yeah. I like the population of those areas could fit inside like our apartment building probably. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. I love it. But uh yeah, so they're together. Uh uh Ephraim's the newbie and fucking Thomas Wake, Willem Dafoe is just harassing. Yeah, he's the his boss. Hell out of him. He clearly is power tripping because he's fucking boss of the lighthouse. But he claims the lamp as his own, even though the manual says to switch yes, off. Yes, that's right. This is fu- the fucking manual. This constant <laughs> fight over the manual is very funny to me. That's the other thing is this movie is fucking hilarious. It is. If, it's if so you funny. have our sense of humor. See, that's what I mean. We talk we talk about that uh, next week with Radio Silence, but like horror comedy, this is my type of horror comedy. Yeah. I think it's so fucking funny because it's dry and motivated and like it's not like a self-aware humor. It just is funny. Yeah, they're not trying to be funny. The humor is just, I don't know, from how these guys are. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. I mean- there is some, like, obviously some of the writing is meant to be funny. The whole fucking lobster thing is just a bit. Yes, it is. Which it's is It's a very extended bit. And the <laughs> fact that, like, the monologue in this movie, again, the monologue that, well, no, that's no, a, different a different one. Ma- okay, monologue, but yeah. yeah, I think this is, like, what people think of when mm-hmm. they think of the monologue in this movie sure. is part of this bit like it's the it's bookended by comedy and you don't realize it until it's over and it's so good yeah because he uh i mean do we care about spoilers Should no i think we're just now all it's spoilers time? we're just all over the place it, in this as one, though it yeah. hasn't been but yeah it's when they're fighting over the cooking and he's, <laughs> i love willem defoe's sincerity it's so and he sweet looks so hurt when I he's like know. you don't like me cooking yeah you don't Please don't say you like me cooking. You, you, you're at fond. least you like me lobster. Tell yeah. me you like me lobster. You're fond of me lobster. Yeah, you're fond of me lobster. And when Pattinson like refuses to say it, he just like launches into this fucking monologue about <sighs> let, so let Neptune strike you down. Hark, Triton, hark. Hello, bid our father, the sea king, rise from the depths full Foul in his fury. And it wasn't until like a minute in that I was, when we saw this the first time that I was like, oh, he's fucking going, yeah. huh? But then he does this all. And then at the end, Robert Panson's like, fine, have it your way. And Lobster's fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's just a bit. It's so good. Oh, man. Their chemistry in this is so good. That, that was right after Robert Pattinson said that if he had a steak, if he had a steak right here, I'd fuck it. If I had a steak, I would fuck it. So there's a lot of arguments about the manual because Willem Dafoe is like, I am going to take care of the lamp at night. Your shift is going to just be all this manual labor. Your shift is all, yeah, just carrying stuff and cleaning stuff. And it's so so funny because Robert Pattinson comes in to his job and he's like, he's clearly read the manual. (laughs) And is like ready to get to work. I know he wants to be a good. He, employee. he does. He wants to be a good second. And <laughs> immediately, Willem Dafoe is like, "Here, have a a drink." Yeah. And oh, it's bad luck to you know not share a drink with you. Blah 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 blah. Man, what don't drink best have his reason. There you go. I'm glad you wrote down a bunch of like. I wrote quotes. a few of those. Yeah. And so, but. Robert Pattinson's like, dude, that's like, we can't drink on the job. And that's the first time we get Willem Dafoe like, no, no, it's it's fine. But Your, your job is to do what I say. Exactly. Yeah. And then he, Robert Pattinson even tries to compromise and he like pours out the alcohol and puts in some water to do the toast just so it's not bad luck. But like since he hasn't cleaned out the cistern yet, it's poop water. Watching this a second time, I was really trying to get a feel for like, what do I think is the story here? And yeah. what do I think is going on between them? And especially after doing a little bit more research into what Eggers is incorporating into this, which is a lot of mythology. Mm-hmm. Um, and he, in one interview I read, pretty explicitly stated, he like, this is Prometheus and Proteus in a lighthouse. And as someone who's not uh, like woefully... Uh, unfamiliar with the specifics of Greek mythology. Could you expand on that? Yeah, so Proteus was a, I believe, a titan who, or no, I'm sorry. Proteus is like 
the old man of the sea. That's like what he, so he's basically what Willem Dafoe is. Okay. He's like this old, yeah. And I forget if he's a Titan or a God. I don't know. I don't know my mythology that well, mm-hmm. but a characteristic of Proteus is that he's malleable. Like he is changeable and ever changing and ever shifting. The imagery of Proteus being this ever changing man of the sea is kind of already what we see Willem Dafoe doing here. He's like, the rules are what I make him to be. We're changing. You know, you're coming in with your structure and you have this idea of how things are going to go, but you do as I say, I'm changing what the routine is going to be. And He's he changes, constantly uh, changing his, the rules. And like the truth about exactly. like how he got his bum leg, yep. whether it was his, from disease His stories or are kind of always shifting and changing. You never get a sense of who this dude really is because his stories are always off. And sometimes he's friendly and sometimes he's flat out yes, mean. Yes, yeah. yeah. When he's drunk, he's fun. But yeah. when he's sober, he's such a mean <laughs> boss. Um, and that like, that constant shifting is, I think, the exact opposite <laughs> of what Robert Pattinson's character needs right because Robert <laughs> yeah. Pattinson is clearly just so affected by it in the worst way down to like every kind of tall tale that Willem Dafoe is talking about Robert Pattinson's already paranoid and starts incorporating it into this like I don't know like all these weird visions he has like the stuff about um Willem Dafoe's prior second mm-hmm he said, oh, he went mad. He died talking about mermaids and sirens and all that Saint kind Elmo's of crap. Fire, yeah, exactly. Another maritime thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's after he says that, that's when we start to get Robert Pattinson's POV changing. Because we see the movie through Robert Pattinson's eyes. Like he's kind of our our surrogate, if there's yeah, any. Yeah, uh, between the two of them. But for the sure. world of like the world of the movie starts to shift and change, and that's when we start getting the more surreal stuff. Is when ever Willem Dafoe's character is telling him some story that really plants the seeds of paranoia, and doubt into Robert Pattinson's head. And I I did take notes this time. Every time Willem Dafoe says something like, oh, my second died, or oh, seagulls have the souls of sailors in them. It's always after that, that we see some iteration of that manifesting in something that Robert Pattinson sees. Oh, so, because I was curious about this. The first time we see the seagull fucking with Robert Pattinson, does it not have one eye does it have both eyes it does have one eye oh okay but i don't think willem dafoe ever says his second had one eye Never does as far as what i saw and then later at near the end of the movie pattinson when he's accusing him Mm -hmm. he says like you're one-eyed yeah second so what and it it was cool to watch this again to be able to piece this all together so i think what happens is you have Willem Dafoe say okay my second died because he went nuts Mm -hmm. and then you have robert pattinson thinking oh man this guy probably murdered his second and then he gets the idea that seagulls have the souls of dead sailors in them so then he's getting like this seagull with one eye is fucking with him and so in his head he's thinking this is a a dead person this is this must be his second that he murdered yeah totally (laughs) and then he that's when he sees the head with one eye in the lobster trap Mm -hmm. and so it's always Oh, that head had one eye? Yes. Oh, okay, okay. And so that's where he's getting this crazy idea that the like his second was a dude with one eye and Willem Dafoe murdered him. Like, it's always... Got it. His craziness is always affected by whatever Willem Dafoe is saying, like, you know, not intentionally, but... I'm curious. Um, he sees the mermaid pretty early, though. Yeah. Uh, although I guess it's after he finds he the finds mermaid the carving m- in the bed. And it's after, or no, that might be before Willem Dafoe says that his second, like, was. Going. It is right before because I have uh, notes that you know I took in order. So uh, yeah, he um, Robert Pattinson goes into the water. Pretty early on, sees all the logs, mm-hmm. which are a manifestation of his previous job, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And among them, that mermaid, who uh, that's not when he feels her up. That's just, she just wakes up and starts screaming. 
and uh, it's a little bit later on because that, then we have him doing chores, including heaving that fucking oil drum up all those stairs, only for Willem Dafoe to be like, take it back down. Why wouldn't you just use this tiny oil drum instead, you idiot? <laughs> yeah, and then it's after that that Willem Dafoe talks about how his second went crazy. Yeah. But th- he it's that conversation where he says, it's bad luck to kill a seabird. Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm wondering, just kind of, talking aloud about you know my kind of theory that Willem Dafoe is I think as a character I think he's just kind of he's an old man who exaggerates and tells stories I don't think he's nefarious I don't think he killed his second I don't know if he killed his second I do think that he is an asshole an asshole boss who's writing in his log yeah all this bullshit about Robert Pattinson that isn't fair like saying he got drunk on the job after he yes. made him get drunk yeah, yeah, on the yeah, last yeah, yeah. night yeah um but I think Robert Pattinson is taking literally everything and blowing it up to the yeah. point where I don't think Willem Dafoe is ever naked in that lighthouse you don't think so I don't know like now that I'm kind of like thinking through this because he sees him naked and starts seeing all this weird sexual stuff after he sees Willem Dafoe masturbating. And I think maybe he just projects it because Willem Dafoe is also very protective of the light. So I think maybe in Robert Pattinson's head, it's like, oh, I caught him in this weird sexual situation. He's also the obsessed with the lighthouse. Yeah. yeah. Therefore, he is fucking the lighthouse. <laughs> and, you know, I, so I think maybe that could all be okay. a weird fantasy, too. I do think there's a shot pretty early on after Willem Dafoe claims soul duty over the lighthouse that where we just see him uh, by himself up there with the lamp and he's like, to ye me beauty, which could still f- go along with what you're saying and that he just, you know, says that to the lamp, but he's not fucking it. Right. Or whatever Pattinson begins I d- to I think. think. I just think there's a lot of, like, Robert Pattinson's like the most unreliable character to be seeing this movie through. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't even know how much of the, you know, weird lighthouse sex stuff is <laughs> Yeah, we get a lot, because like, uh, what he... Go- Pattinson goes upstairs the the uppermost part of uh, where the lamp itself is is locked he can't get up there mm-hmm. but at one point he like Willem Dafoe's up there and yeah there's jizz there's jizz trips through and then we get two separate scenes of ma- uh, Pattinson masturbating to the mermaid yeah. one while he's just fucking drinking it's insane it's looking so when is he that goes- where he has a hat on Yes, he has it's this my favorite thing. floppy hat on. I think he's got like, he's shirtless with suspenders. Yeah, and he's got like a sailor hat on. And he's jerking off and drinking. Is he drinking turpentine at that point? Because they oh, run out of alcohol at some if point. He's drinking just... turp- I think that might be before, dude. I think I think that's how far gone he is, is. I think he's doing like the weird little hat and suspenders thing before the turpentine. Yeah. Hey, want to talk about our sponsor this week, First Leave. First Leave. First Leave. It's a mail order curated wine club. They curate wine for you and send it to you. Because, like, basically my wine shopping experience is I pick the labels I like. That's exactly what I do. I I just pick what labels look cool. I say nothing on the bottom shelf and whatever label looks cool from the middle shelf. It was an exciting (laughs) moment in our relationship where we one day honestly said to each other, we deserve better than the bottom shelf. No more bottom shelf No more bottom shelf. Uh, (laughs) What's nice is first leave, I would argue, bottom shelf prices, especially this intro pack that you can get. Dude, we got six bottles of wine. Yeah, so this is 29 let me uh 29.95 yeah. six bottles of wine it's less than five bucks a bottle yeah so it is bottom shelf prices bottom shelf but in prices. most of these retail for over 20 bucks we got a few here if you're watching the video damn they all come with these little cards so we, i have a card about each one and it mm-hmm. kind of tells you the flavor profiles and like what kind of foods that it'll pair with that's and so nice where it's from it is like, nice it, it does all the work for you it just tells you you get to learn a little bit about stuff because like i like red wine but I don't know the details. There's of- certain red wines I don't like. Yeah, and it's hard for me to know w- which they are. So when I go to a uh, event and people are like, hey, we have these wines, I'm like, uh. Yeah. Yeah. But what was nice is I filled out a little taste profile. So mm-hmm. these are curated to me specifically. Sorry, James. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I filled out this little taste profile on their website. And so they sent me this first pack. And if there's any 
wine you don't like that you get, they have a hundred percent satisfaction guaranteed. Yeah, yeah. So They'll cover the cost of that wine. Exactly. That's so, so cool. If you are interested in First Leaf, if you are craving a bit of drink after this <laughs> lighthouse episode <laughs> yeah don't go, drink turpentine we'll go a little honey. classier than the the turpentine they end up drinking in this movie uh you can sign up uh with the link in the description it's uh firstleaf.com slash dead meat you get an intro offer it's six bottles of wine for only 29.95 that's like what we have here i don't yeah, have all man. the bottles over here but there's too many bottles six bottles of wine for only 29.95 plus free shipping go to firstleaf.com slash dead meat You will not find a better deal on wine than this. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) (laughs) Our other sponsor this week is Shudder. Our friends at Shudder. Yeah, Shudder. Yeah, we love Shudder, obviously. It's it's so good. We both use it and love it. It's a basically horror Netflix. They have such an amazing curated website. It's like obscure stuff you couldn't find anywhere else really good playlists put together by actual people which is nice sometimes you'll go on other streaming services and it's like things that you would like if you're into this and they're all algorithm derived yeah no 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 they have playlists put together by people which is really really nice Mm -hmm. um yeah just $5.99 a month which is that's so good yes and yeah shutter what i absolutely love about it is that it's got something for everyone if you need to catch up on classics that you haven't seen it's got those if you've seen all the classics and you want something a little more obscure it's got plenty of those like it's so cool such a wide variety of horror movies yes and they have a new exclusive series called the deadlands that comes out on january 23rd um, it's about a Maori tribe, which I think is really cool. It was done with um, consultation, and it's a very well-informed series uh, with a Maori focus, which I think is really neat. That's great. Yeah, so that's like the un- it's like a rift between the living and the dead. There's some. I don't know if it's like ghosties or spirits or what, but it sounds very, very cool. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Also, we've got a new creep show, too. Yep, a Greg Nicotero, acclaimed makeup artist. Exactly. And uh, Tigers Are Not Afraid. I still need to watch that. I'll have to catch up on that. Dude, they've got Mandy on Shudder. We love Mandy. That wild-ass Nick Cage movie. Big fans of Mandy. (laughs) So if you want to try out Shudder for 30 days. That's You can watch so much stuff. Yeah, you can. 30 days for free. Go to Shudder.com and use promo code DEADMEAT30. That's uh, DEADMEAT, like the show, and then 30. Mm-hmm. And that's Shudder, S-H-U-D-D-E-R. That's right. Yeah, like the, ugh, not yeah. the window yeah. ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm wrong about the order of things, please say so. But I'm pretty sure that... In, in watching this again, I realized that, like, viewing everything through Robert Pattinson's eyes, everything we see that is, like, extremely strange from his POV is affected by something said by Willem Dafoe. That he's or just, like, that inter- he is, it's nested exactly, into his brain. Exactly, he's internalizing. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and then, yeah, that makes him, like, the... Like, so we talked about, like, Proteus, and then oh, yes. Robert Pattinson is the Prometheus. So sure, so what's the his pairing. deal? So Prometheus is, like... He, I think, Prometheus is a titan, I think, um, who essentially, like, he he takes fire from the gods and gives it to man. It's his gift to man. He gives man fire and civilization, oh, and nice. the gods get pissed. Zeus is especially pissed, and he um, basically chains up Prometheus to a rock where an eagle comes and eats his liver every day. He's like, so every day his, he... It grows back because he's immortal, so mm-hmm. he just has his liver eaten over and over again forever until he gets saved by Hercules. And so that's the last exactly, shot of the movie, yeah, yeah. That was when I, that was like the most on the nose one, mm-hmm. uh, but still cool, especially because that's a fucking cool ass shot. It's so <laughs> neat. It also plays into like you know he desires the lighthouse, he desires fire, he desires knowledge, and you have the guy who outranks him this god denying it to him and then he's ultimately punished for seeking the light Mm. yeah it's interesting yeah there's a lot of like mythology and if i'm there i'm sure there are many of you listening or watching who know more about mythology than me it it is crazy how like as a kid because i really liked mythology as a kid and then you go to college and i think i took a couple 
classes on mythology. I did one on Norse mythology. And then you realize, oh, studying mythology is hard. It's so it's its in- own fucking it's field. It's so intense. Yeah. There's so much. Because, yeah, I, I liked it as a kid. And then, uh, like, a few years ago, like, I got a little book to go th- over stuff. And I was like, it was overwhelming. It's so There's hard. so much. Well, because every... Every like mythological figure has like ten D- different versions yeah, they have of their different stories, versions, different contradicting yeah. stories, different names. Yeah, it's it's a mess. And, I wish I knew it better. And it's amazing how those changes reflect, uh, you know, like what's going on. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's a lot. But that's kind of the basic gist of the Prometheus and Proteus stuff. Surely I got lots of it wrong, but. Willem Dafoe looks old in this movie. He does. Because I'm watching this movie. I'm like, damn, is Dafoe in it? He's got to be in his mid-70s. He's 64. Yeah. They They aged him up a bit. I was reading that when he got the script from Eggers, he was like, I'm not that old. Oh, really? He's, <laughs> yeah. They, but they make, they make him, him look old. It's the first time in anything I've watched him in where I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not attracted to him in this. Oh, you aren't? I'm he's, shocked, hon. I mean, he's just so gross to yeah. all those farts. <laughs> oh my god, we the, that's also we get, a reason I, with that we love this movie. I think is there's so farts many farts funny, in man. it. Farts are always funny. Yeah, before there's a single line of dialogue in this movie, big, there are two fart. farts yeah. and <laughs> peeing in a bucket. Yeah, which also comes back hilariously after it floods <laughs> yeah. and he's trying to pee in this floating this bucket. bucket. The yeah, it's <laughs> floating around. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's all gross in this movie. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, when he, the, when he was uh near the end, being on all fours and being led around like a dog on a Holy. leash, I was like, D- you can't do that to an old man. You can't and do so- that to Willem Dafoe. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, isn't that when you were like, <laughs> yes, that okay? So there's a moment in this where, and this is towards the end. This is when like stuff's just gone off the fucking chain. Because the whole movie, Dafoe's calling him a dog. Yeah, calling Patters- Pat. Is it Pattinson? Pattinson, Pattinson yeah. a dog. Yeah. And and so finally, near the end, Robert Pattinson fucking puts a leash on Willem <laughs> Dafoe and is making him bark and is walking him around. And it's the funniest shit ever. And that moment in the theater was when it really hit me hard that I was <laughs> like, oh, my God, it's the Green Goblin and Edward Cullen <laughs> in this doing this right now in front of my eyes. And it, it just like really blew me away. <laughs> I love too that Robert Pattinson when he was like, I think there was, because he wanted to work with Eggers. Eggers wanted to work with him. And Eggers sent him a script for something else where it would be Robert Pattinson playing more of like a Victorian kind of gentleman. And Pattinson was like, no, like, you know, that's me playing me. It's not like, I want to do stuff that's weird. And then he sent him this, and Pattinson was like, "Yes, yeah, like I'm, I'm fucking in." Guys, I love <laughs> Robert Pattinson. I think he's I wonderful. Mean, after good time, he's yeah. a treasure. I because I love that he's he just picks weird stuff. It makes me feel optimistic about that new Batman because I trust his taste at this point, and I don't think he would pick a superhero movie if it wasn't something kind of cool and sure. fun. It's it surprised me when that news came out, and a lot of the response I saw online was like. Edward Cullen, because like I, it was probably because I never watched the Twilight movies. I watched them all in one day with you a few years ago, and that's the extent yeah. of my Twilight <laughs> experience. But to me, he's not that anymore, just because I know that he's been up to weird shit like yeah, this. he's in the indie circuit. Yeah, and, and same thing with Kristen Stewart. It's yeah, so funny they're how they're those killing two... it. We still gotta see Underwater. Um, that's in theaters right now. Oh, and she's in that. Yeah, horror oh, horror fuck. people that I whose opinions I trust say it's a good as hell yeah, time. I've yeah. heard it compared to The Descent. So oh, let's fun go. in the ocean. Great. That's not that's cool. okay. <laughs> but I'll go see it. So uh, hey, Taylor Lautner, whenever you want to start doing indie weird flicks, dude, I'll cast you in whatever I decide to make <laughs> when I make it. Come on, Taylor, let's go. <laughs> Uh, there is amazing seagull acting in this movie. Ooh, we, that okay. That fucking bird. I don't know how Eggers goes <laughs> and casts all these amazing animals. Well, 
Ralph Innocent would not call the Black Phil yeah, goat Black amazing. Yeah, Black Phil was a bad he goat. He was a dick on set. But he, you know what? He's method. Oh, I'm sorry. We're like, oh, when Daniel Day Lewis is method and is a dick to he everyone. Moved around the set it's of my fu- left foot. That's because right. He- yeah. <laughs> oh, then it's fine. But when this goat is the playing the literal fucking devil. <laughs> <laughs> and Can't almost it. gores Ralph yeah. Innocent. Oh, and set. what? All of a sudden it's a problem? <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah, I wonder if the seagull was a the dick. The seagull's so funny. It just, I don't know, like, <laughs> how does the seagull have comedic timing? I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, My just him is... standing in front of Robert Pattinson like, meh. <laughs> My favorite is when Pattinson's sleeping that night and it oh! like lands on the windowsill, walks halfway, and then... pecks up the window, and then leaves. How <laughs> the fuck do you, because tra- seagulls are not, and maybe I'm wrong here, seagulls aren't smart. No one keeps them as pets. <laughs> well, yeah, that'd they're be nasty. Weird. <laughs> even, but even like people even keep pigeons. Like you can train pigeons to go do stuff. Sure, seagulls. I feel like are no one wants to fuck with. Maybe those. they're the cats of birds. Maybe they're not dumb. They, they just, just don't, don't give care. a fuck. Yeah, seagulls pass the mirror test. <laughs> they don't. I'm sure they don't. I, I don't know. I mean, so, it, there is a bird that does. I forget what kind. Some oh, weird animals I bet it's like it. a macaw or something. One of those that jungle almost birds. sounds right. Maybe something like that. They're smart. Or a crow. Or a raven. I don't think it was a... Yeah, it, it would be a raven over a crow, which I always mix up. But yeah. a raven is the bigger, smarter one, right? Yeah. Raven's yeah. got to pass the mirror test, right? I don't... That's a, t- that's a hard test. That's it a is. real hard test. The, if you don't know what the fuck we're talking about, <laughs> the mirror test is you look into, into a mirror. So like when humans look into a mirror, we recognize that it's us. Mm-hmm. When an animal looks into the mirror, most animals most do not see it's another animal. So it is one form of sentience testing. It's not the yeah. end all be all, uh, but it is you know if an animal can recognize that oh that's me because uh, I think with elephants in particular they would like put, show it the animal itself in the mirror and then put like a, a thing of red paint mm-hmm. on it. And then it would look in the mirror and then use the mirror to try to get that off. Yeah, so they recognize that it's them yeah, and not so another. Yeah, so it's a very limited number it's of animals. I think elephants, dolphins perhaps. Dolphins, I feel like. Eight, one type of bird and maybe God, do pigs? probably greater apes. I don't think pigs do. Okay. Uh, but the greater apes do, I believe. So yeah, look that up. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. I love uh, seeing different forms of animal intelligence. They yeah. come unevenly. Anyway, how do you train a seagull to I don't do know. this? It's so cute, though. It's great. And then Robert Pattinson fucking murders the hell out Dude. of it. Dude. Oh, my God. Because it's, it's, again, the one with no eye. Mm-hmm. And it's just taunting him as he's pouring whatever into the... I don't know what it is. Is it lie or is it like... It might be lie. It looks like chalk, whatever, to, uh, yeah, I don't to know. make the cistern water drinkable. Not- ass water yeah because he's been doing that but then one morning he wakes up and it's like sledge coming out of the pump Mm because there's a dead bird in it yeah so while he's looking at that the other the cyclops seagull is like yeah and and he he grabs that seagull and just fucking it is it's (laughs) violent but like i know it's not funny but it is because he's so like easily fucking Hashtag triggered by this <laughs> seagull. He grabs it by the neck and just goes to town on this thing. Maybe it's less gruesome because it's in black and white. It, I think that's a big part I of it. I think it's a huge part of why it's not as horrifying as it could be, even though it's <laughs> it's still really fucked up. Yeah, and this is after Willem Dafoe was like, I saw you f- fucking with that sea. It's bad luck bad to luck kill a seabird. Bad luck to kill a seabird. And sure enough, after he kills it, we is that the sh- is that that cool shot where it like pans across and then all the way up? I think so. To That's the when the, the wind. Yep. Vein. So after he kills the the seagull, the wind literally changes. Mm-hmm. I was reading something. It was an interview with Eggers about um just how like he's he's aware that this movie is like impenetrable and <laughs> doesn't make sense and is purposely really confusing and disorienting, but. The reason, and I agree that this is why this movie works, is he purposely wrote in things like, it's bad luck to kill a seeper. That's a pretty, like, it's, we're we're setting rules up for Mm -hmm. this world. Um, We're 
having a very and he even calls it it's a it's a cliche on the no shot of the wind literally changing it's the but you need those super um like those are shots where they're not ambiguous and it's you can't argue with it like oh it's a shot of the wind changing clearly that symbolizes this yeah there's no ambiguity there he's like you need those guideposts for a movie like this where it the rest of it is weird you li- you need those little things to anchor you to it and to keep you invested in the story like those things that are just unambiguously understandable and have meaning yes he killed a seabird that is bad things will get worse now right because of that right yeah And I think uh, another thing from The Witch, which is uh, I found really interesting and I couldn't really work into the kill count just because, you know, I couldn't, is he wrote that film in a way to where he says that back then for people, there wasn't a divide between the supernatural and the real. Mm -hmm. Like fairy tales were real. The, The stories of the witches that that movie explored wasn't something that they thought of as like a fiction or like a tale that was their reality. And mm-hmm. so in that movie, that is the reality. And when you realize that it's super fucking cool. Yeah. That he's like giving credence to that world, like pre science, pre mass. Yeah. Like what if that was all real? And yeah. It's terrifying. Yeah. And, he's and doing I think that there's exact a exact No, mm-hmm. he is, you're, you're, you're totally. Yeah. When he talks about the mythology in this, um, not even like the kind of like allegory, like the like Prometheus and stuff, but even mm-hmm. just like ocean luck and superstition and the idea that killing a seabird is bad luck and the souls of sailors. And yeah, it, it, that's exactly, I think that's like a big thing of his. And I think that's going to be something we keep seeing in his films is the idea of myth and playing with the importance of it and making it real because it's fucking scary. If yeah. the, if that stuff if that is shit's real, real, that's terrifying. It's so terrifying. Because didn't you? The next thing he's doing is like Vikings, Vikings in like the, what the 11th century yeah, or some and he shit. Said, yeah, like Viking with that. He's gonna get like down and dirty. He was like, this isn't gonna be you know Mohawk tat Vikings. Like you kind of you have that idea of like a Viking and they're no no no. This is like old school superstition religion it might have to Vikings. be in subtitles the whole oh, thing I'm so excited uh, oh, i know what, what, what is, is it alexander skarsgård and nicole, nicole kidman, kidman as the leads yeah but then also bill skarsgård's in it i think so and anya taylor joy maybe yes is she also returning to work with i them? believe so that, that yeah, shit's man. gonna get fucked Fuck up. I'm yeah. excited. Keep them coming, Robert Eggers. I heard a rumor somewhere, and maybe someone can tell me if, like, they also have heard this. Like, I, I didn't just fucking make this. I don't. Maybe this is not just like a wish fulfillment thing that I. I just want this to happen. I heard somewhere that he was gonna do a Arthurian dragon type movie, like a Saint George and the Dragon movie, and like there are fucked up monsters and shit in Arthurian lore that I think like all adaptations of that era of writing don't really touch on like the descriptions of monsters from back then are so weird and scary and a lot of them weirdly it would be so cool to play with this a lot of them are like uh I forget in what story it's one of the like Knights of the Round Table story it might be like Sir Galahad it's fucking one of them I don't know he sees this monster and it's described in this way that when you look at it, you realize, oh my God, this person is trying to describe a giraffe. But like, what is a giraffe? Oh, okay. It, instead, it is like this weirdo <laughs> monster that when you actually kind of put the pieces together, you're like, oh my God, it's a giraffe. But like, they wouldn't. Yeah, they have horns too. Because right? back then, it's so crazy to think people wouldn't actually see animals in real life. They just have this like handed down description of what these what animals are. Mm-hmm. So then you get all these weird monsters, basically, and all these old stories. And I'm like, fuck, I want like, him. Like that's to... not real. I... How big's the neck? Yeah, fuck you. I want him to do in like all the weird like like etiquette codes of Arthurian times. Have you fun to play with? And that's all kinds of superstition and witches and stuff too. Come on, man. I don't know where I heard that, but it like fucking sucks that I made, I might've just made that. I might just dreamt that. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah. So after he kills the seabird, 
is they're get they're eating dinner and they're like we we're, we're getting off this rock tamari so time to for you to finally join me in a drink yeah and man they get drunk they get hammered it's my favorite them drinking in this is my favorite shit there's a few times yeah. it's so good where they're they're dancing around and singing shanties mm-hmm. and the best is when they're they're running around and dancing and then it cuts to them sitting there and Willem Dafoe is like and a pretty lass she were taken off her bonnet oh man tell me more she took off her bonnet dude I <laughs> oh. uh, the next morning you know because they're like we're getting off this rock tomorrow oh this is when we start getting like don't try your time don't worry shit. about yeah trying yeah because obviously stuff. the ship never comes to pick them up uh i think around here is when uh, a very hungover robert pattinson uh goes to empty the chamber pot <laughs> walks all the way to the end of the rock to dispose of it properly throws it into the wind and it just splatters all him this poo. piss and shit just goes right into it. it's confirmed that's a big lebowski reference oh okay. confirmed from it might have been <laughs> eggers's ama on reddit but i had that in my notes it's like oh man he big lebowski himself with shit but like that actually is just a straight up reference and then that's when he sees the mermaid again and then fucking feels her up yeah she's a you know a naked a topless mermaid but and also if you've ever w- were like how do you sex with a mermaid this movie tells you they've got a mermaid vagina they do it's right there apparently inspired by shark vaginas oh is that what those are yeah is that what that looks like i get yeah okay Mm -hmm. because i i was i forget who and bless them i forget what news outlet was like let's talk about the mermaid vagina because not many interviews had the courage to go there but uh he was saying something about like, you know, like the Starbucks mermaid has the two tails. Mm-hmm. And so if you, you have mermaids like that and that's like an old school type mermaid. Yeah, there's a way to fuck them because there'd be a sure, spot a, for a an opening. Mm-hmm. Um, He was like, but I want to do like, you know, like a mermaid. Like we all think of a mermaid with the one tail. Yeah. All right. I'll put a vagina on. This <laughs> right. A vagina right there. You yeah. Can put it there. Whatever. It's. A lot of fun. This the whole like montage. I don't know if it's right around here, but he there's like that montage of him like thinking about fucking this mermaid, and then it's intercut with like logs and like the back of that dude's head, yeah. and like the the cant hook is what it is that what he is like it? hits him with oh. the cant hook. I'm not even exactly so, sure. So okay, is. yeah. Later on, uh, uh, one Willem Dafoe very shortly says that they've been there for weeks long yeah. extra. Yeah, and this is this like, is the morning. Okay, so this is like the morning after they wake up. They're all hung over, and I forget what Robert Pattinson says, but Willem Dafoe is like, "Dude, we've been here for weeks. You've been asking me about when you've they're going to come for asking, weeks. Yes. So yeah. either <laughs> either Willem Dafoe is lying. And just fucking with him. Or Robert Pattinson has just been getting so fucking blackout drunk this entire time that every day he wakes up and is like, oh, the people didn't show up. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. Yeah. But that's when Will, uh, uh, some at some point, Will um, Robert Pattinson gets real drunk and talks about like Foreman Winslow, which yes. he said was his name. Yeah. So that's when... Willem Dafoe, a.k.a. Thomas, is just like, I'm sorry, Winslow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so he knows something's up right away. Mm-hmm. And that's when... So I almost called him Edward Cullen, sincerely. Uh, Robert Pattinson is is drunk and he's like ready to kind of... He, he's clearly been feeling guilty this whole movie. There's some kind of guilt. Like, he doesn't want to drink because he, he knows what he is capable of doing. Oh, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And, and he's afraid of talking about it too. Yeah. Which when he gets drunk, that's when that's it comes he's out. talk about it. Okay. Right. So he is clear. And that's why, you know, he's seeing the logs in the water. Mm-hmm. Like he's clearly running from something and, and knows that alcohol is like not going to be, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, he wants to follow the rules, but also, I don't think he it's, doesn't want I think he wants an excuse. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that's when it comes out that he, he says something about his, Foreman Winslow when he back when he was a timberman and they're doing a log run right isn't that what it is so is that chopping down logs and put them down or the river floating them down the them? river okay, yeah. yeah but there was a log jam yes so you know traffic jam with logs yeah so I'm guessing what happens is he has this foreman who's being a fucking dick to him just like Willem Dafoe is yep call yeah, him dog like a, a lot shitty boss yep, yep. and he goes to he considers 
hitting this dude over the back of the head with mm-hmm. this hook thing and doesn't he like refrain he swears up and down he that swears, he does not and i i don't think he did yeah um but then what happens is his foreman loses his balance and falls into the water and because it's a log jam i'm assuming he just gets like sucked crushed. under or, 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 or just or crushed, crushed yeah like he's yeah. like getting churned under and then just crushed by logs mm-hmm. and, and like calling he, out for help yeah he could have saved him but he just chooses not to mm-hmm. and he does a Don Draper and takes his name yeah, and becomes he, Ephraim Winslow, where previously he was Tom, Tom Howard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. His, his real name was Tom Howard, worked with a supervisor named Ephraim Winslow. Guy was a dick. He let him die. Total Don, Don Draper move. Just right. took his name and moved on because right. that guy had a better life. Right. It's just, it's interesting that like, because I'm trying to piece together what his whole, like what's his deal and is it he takes his name because he let him die? Because he technically he didn't technically murder him. Yeah. So I'm wondering, what does he have in his past that he is also okay with letting this dude die to take his name? Because yeah, he might have something bad. I from just his feel past. like there's also some other. But also, if he comes back and he's like, "I was the supervisor," maybe that's a better position to come back from like where's my supervisor pay yeah my worker tom died it, it's amazing know. how back then <laughs> you can't get away with so much stuff. right because those two dudes were just out there doing their job no one else around no fucking osha yeah. prior to this Willem defoe did not want to hear his drunken confessions he said don't you spill your beans yeah and then after Robert Pattinson <laughs> does this sad monologue confessing everything. Defoe kind of disappears. Yeah. And then you just hear his voice echoing throughout the building. Why don't you spill your beans, Tommy? I think maybe Willem Defoe is the type of person who is like, everyone, like, I, I like, you know, everyone's got their own shit and I yeah. don't want to hear it. I've got my shit. I've got that under lock and key, though. I can take care of myself, and you're never going to hear me get drunk and confess all of my shit to you. Yeah. And I think he's really uncomfortable with someone who is, go- like, about to do that. And he's like, I don't want this. I don't want your drama in my life, Robert Pattinson. And that ties into how he's always locking up his uh, little supervisor book. Yeah. Know, his little desk, locking it up, keeping it nice and close to his chest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's uh, after the why'd you spill your beans thing that we get that shot of naked Willem Dafoe at the top of the lighthouse, shining light from his uh, eyes hell into. Yeah. I would have that painting on my wall. That is a literal painting. Oh, that's right. That it's mentioned. referencing it's, a painting, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I thank you, Christian. Wrote down. <laughs> it's called hypnosis. I just want to look up the. Uh... Oh, and also my notes going back to what I was kind of saying. I have Tommy hates lies and Tom hates truth, which like isn't always necessarily the case, but you have Tommy, who is. Robert Pattinson hates he's he's always calling out Willem Dafoe for his lies and he's like you change your story about your leg and yeah. the fact that you said your crew's teeth all fell out but they're eating grass like mm-hmm. he's always like calling out and that's the issue he has with him whereas flip side the issue that Willem Dafoe always has with Robert Pattinson is like his truths and his you know don't dump that stuff on me i don't want to hear it it's yeah. interesting they are like mirrors of each other even down to the fact that in the script they are old man and young man oh really that's young what, just what it says yeah. <laughs> young man uh i have where is that painting huh you know what i just realized uh tommy's shit literally comes back to him yes you know he tries to yeah he tries to get rid of his shit and it just blows back into his face yeah yeah um Oh, I can't even well, she's it. looking for this, you know, it's right before his confession, his drunk confession, that they get the drunkest together. Uh, that might be off the turpentine at this point. At some point, they run out of alcohol <laughs> and just mix honey with turpentine, I think. They mix honey with something you're not supposed to be drinking, and which I'm shocked it's, didn't blind it's them. Hun- oh, yeah. It's honey and turpentine. It is. Tur- okay. Yeah. And they get real fucked oh, up Sasha off that. Oh, Sasha Schneider. That's hard to say. Fuck. Sasha Schneider. Okay. 
is uh, the painting hypnosis. But yeah, that's when they're dancing around and then they like well hard, all these hard cuts to them dancing and singing and then slow dancing together and then very they nearly kissing. Kiss I think other. Willem Dafoe goes in for it and then they like break apart and then get into a fist fight. Yeah, they over gotta always beat each other up. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gay. I'll fight you. Gay, yeah, <laughs> I, I have part, that part of the script. Oh yeah. Yeah, because it's very interesting. This movie, like. Yeah, it's so fucking homoerotic to the point where in in Christian's notes here, one of the pa- uh, painters that Eggers drew influence from, I'm realizing Eggers draws a lot of influence from art, like paintings Man, as much as other. I wish I had that kind of it's ability to amazing. look at all these different kinds of art and then uh, retain them mm-hmm. enough to integrate them into your own art. That's yeah. amazing. One of the artists that he um, used as an inspiration, and again, I'm just, it's a lot here, and now I can't find the exact artist. Um, I think Jean Delville I, is the one I'm thinking of. Uh, his work is, like, super homoerotic. I mean, I was Googling him. Like, it just has all these undertones, and that artist uh, was, like, threatened with being outed for being homosexual so he, that's part of that that is part of his work and the fact that that's a visual influence for those movies mm-hmm. like not a coincidence i don't think so this is when they're like they go to fight they are violently wrestling animalistic grunting breathing sweating legs entwined veiny throats veiny biceps moving back and forth back and forth wrestling breathing grunting sweating and then this is like also from the same scene thunder rumbles they lean into each other it is very tense. It seems like they might kiss. No, that's madness. Yeah. <laughs> so it's there. And like the actors have talked about it. And even Eggers is like, the movie takes place in a lighthouse. It's a giant dick. <laughs> yeah. And I guess that he said <laughs> in, I don't know if this was in his AMA or if this was just from like, another interview he did but he was talking about how it they had an uh yes okay this is in a fortune magazine interview Edgar said that a there was an original like cut that would have been nc-17 um and the like lighthouse is a dick thing was going to be much more explicit and he says in early conversations there was in the masturbation montage a shot of an erect penis to be match cut into the lighthouse. Wow. And executives were like, look, we can't have it be black and white and MC17. <laughs> <laughs> we will make no money. <laughs> so. Fair enough. Fair. <laughs> yeah, I thought you could see a dick during one of the masturbation scenes, but I think it was just his hand. But you 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 know, you get his ass. Mm-hmm. He's got his ass hanging out of his pants while he's definitely man ass in this movie. Mm-hmm. That made me also like all the all the homoerotic stuff made me wonder too if like part of and I I didn't get this as much the second time because I had more of a clear idea of what the backstory was here. But I was like, did he fuck his former supervisor and is he like guilty about it and like killing him? But I I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know if there's any of that. I don't know if there is. Is in here. I was I think I was confused because the montage is like him fucking this mermaid intercut the with like and then we head. see the back of a guy's head and I'm yeah. like so but maybe that's on per you know to, to instill that like is that also what he is feeling guilt? Mm-hmm. over and running from because they also both talk about like wives and um Robert Pattinson's like you know I want to settle down have a wife blah, blah, blah. and they both are are constantly comparing each other to women um oh, yeah because he <laughs> Robert Pattinson says in one of my favorite lines that like got the biggest laugh out of me this time he's like stop being such an old bitch to <laughs> Willem Dafoe and the lobster. Yeah. 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 And then later Willem Dafoe when at the end when he it's like his last big thing at Robert Pattinson where he's like really taunting him being an asshole is he's like, look at ye handsome lad with eyes bright as a lady, a painted actress screaming in the footlights. A bitch what wants to be coveted for nothing but being born, crying about the silver spoon what should have been yours. And clearly they're very lonely in this lighthouse. They're always jerking off to fucking wooden figures of mermaids. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, It turns out 
they had not yet gotten to the turpentine and honey oh, when they God. had that fight. That comes a little later. Like, like I can't believe the order of things. Because, it is like, it is crazy. You have I in my according to my notes, Willem Dafoe takes an axe to that lifeboat, and then, allegedly, sure, and then says that. Robert Dude, Pattinson. Robert did. Pattinson, you did that. What oh are you talking God, you about? Gaslighting mother- With that, I believe Robert Pattinson. I don't know. Yeah, that. yeah, I think I do. I think Willem Dafoe's gaslighting him a bit. Okay, but then like after that is when they completely run out of drink because they had dug up a like, provision emergency box of booze, yeah. ran through that, and then finally they get to the turpentine and honey right before a giant storm breaks out the windows of the lighthouse yeah. and floods the whole place. And just to give you an idea of like how bad turpentine would be for you, um, so I... Like I, I paint and like oil paints. Oh, you, God, you use, yeah. you mix with um, you use like, f- like flaxseed oil and also turpentine or turpenoid. And like, you, if you're working with turpentine and turpenoid, you have to work in a ventilated studio. <laughs> like <laughs> you can't just even it, like having it enclosed near you. The fumes are bad for you. I can't believe they're fucking drinking it. After the flood is when. Willem Dafoe's log book floats over to Robert Pattinson and he reads through it and Mm -hmm. finds out that Willem Dafoe had been writing all these things about bad work ethic and recommended severance without pay. Yeah, holy shit. Holy fuck. If if you had done all that work and then severance without pay after months of abuse by farting ass Willem Dafoe. God damn your Your farts. farts. (laughs) God So that's when he, he turns him into a dog. Yeah, and I think we, we were watching this with our friends and our friend Erica. When when he's walking him around like a dog on the beach, Erica's like, "What if the other dude showed up right now?" <laughs> like, hey, there was a storm, but uh. oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he fucking puts him in that grave. That's when he's dumping dirt on him, and then this is when it's it's like. I don't even know. I I got so confused even a second time. So Robert Pattinson goes back into the lighthouse. But then Willem Dafoe runs in. Dude, the first time we watched that, I was terrified. The second time I was writing something when it happened, so it didn't get me. But when we saw it in theaters and Robert Pattinson's inside, and I forget what he's doing. Mm. Uh, I think he's getting the key for the lamp or whatever. But Dafoe just runs in and is like, Her life belongs to me! Oh, wait, but we forgot about the, oh my God, uh, there's an imagery of some point where he's looking, uh, Robert Pattinson is, I think it's after he bar- buries Defoe, he's like, he sees Ephraim Winslow, who then turns into a mermaid, who then turns into Willem Defoe, yeah. who then turns into Willem Defoe, but with barnacles yeah, and tentacles. Right, where he's like all cockle shells. He turns Looks into like Davy fucking Jones. He turns man. into fucking Neptune. He's that's like the poem. Yeah, the, he's, yeah. And there's tentacles and what the it's fuck? wild, man. Oh, it's so good. It's so good when these just little splashes of uh, yeah, visual effects are stuff. used. Yeah, dude. I think it's even after that too. Sorry, it's really hard to remember the order <laughs> so of. Hard. Especially this third act. I think it's even after that where they go and drink more fucking turpentine and they're sitting in the base of the like actual lighthouse tower and they're just like, oh, (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. But anyway, so back. So, okay. So, (laughs) so Tom, Tommy kills Thomas and finally gets the keys to the damn light. Finally gets gets up to that light. Crawl up to the light and. I love this is so great. He sits up there and he's finally in the, the like a little tower part and the light and the door just opens, opens on its own. Yeah, to the so lamp. So he can look inside and this shot the genuinely shot the sound. unnerved Holy me, fuck. especially in a theater. The like it's it's a shot of Robert Pattinson and his it's all kind of blown out mm-hmm. and he is looking into the light of the lighthouse and just starts screaming and the sound is like so degraded and scary it just it really sent chills down my spine because first he's laughing and then he's just screaming Mm -hmm. and yeah it's like blown out visually and on the audio it's it's a nightmare and it's 
such great like it you know classic kind of like lovecrafty and like oh we can't even imagine what he sees he's just i'm assuming at least like if i had to guess it's just all it's just every you know it's all of knowledge or something he just goes fucking crazy or some shit yeah it's just too much it's if we're gonna keep going with the mythology it's like pandora's box or mm-hmm. some shit you know so then he fall first he falls to that platform and breaks his legs yeah by the sounds and he of it, falls down and the steps spiraling down the staircase that was when i wrote that i thought maybe that's how willem dafoe fucked his leg up oh yeah that makes sense is maybe he the first time he went up to the lighthouse and and again who knows maybe he did kill his second or maybe he was the second and killed his superior <laughs> so that he could get lighthouse access Ooh, then he would be and then he like what if Tommy. he i was gonna say what if he did the same thing like yeah. he took the superior's name so now he's a superior and gets all the lighthouse access mm. could be i honestly kind of like that now that i say it out loud but <laughs> i think that's maybe what happened to him i think he fell and fucked up his leg and that's why his story is not quite right yeah so but then tommy yeah tumbles down all those staircases and then somehow he's outside on the beach getting his liver pecked at by a seagull but we're assuming it's willem defoe oh yeah yeah (laughs) picking out his innards for all eternity just like oh my god prometheus and it's a very the end shot is very surreal it is also like a direct reference to a painting Mm. um again i forget the artist but yeah wow Lighthouse, man. Lighthouse is crazy. It's fucking wild. I love it. I love it so much. And it's not like, you know, you think art house film. Yeah. You think long. This is less than two hours. Mm -hmm. I think it's an hour 50. Yeah. So, you know, longer than an average 90 minute movie, but it's wild enough to keep it moving the whole time. Yeah. And also this movie, it, it might sound like it's very inaccessible, um, which I maybe to some people it would be because sure. it is super fucking weird. But we watched it with a few friends of ours who, you know, have, they're not into horror. They're not into horror one, and they're also not as into stuff that is like purposely weird and like obtuse and just like you know hard to parse. You mm-hmm. know, more like experimental shit. But they had a blast during yeah, they this movie. Love it, man. This movie is very like it just does what it's doing so well. Like it does weird so well. I think if you know you're on the fence about it, or if you have friends you maybe want to watch it with, I like give it a shot because well, definitely it's, give it a shot. It's it's so entertaining and the weirdness is like a lot of fun. I don't think it's a movie where you watch it and think, oh, this movie thinks it's smarter than me, mm-hmm. you know? I, Cause I think that's often what puts people off from weirder stuff. Um, but yeah. I just like movies that can transport me to another place and oh, or yeah. time this one and just sustain that for the duration of the movie. And that's what this does for almost two hours. You are hanging out on this fucking rock with these two crazy ass, Seamen, yeah, who are suspicious or fucking supernatural is all hell. Fucking love it. Yeah, so good. Yeah, so yeah, let us know what you think of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and let us know your interpretations of it because yeah, pretty it's pretty damn open to mm-hmm. whatever. I'd love to hear other takes on it. Yeah, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. So next week, as we said, interviewing Radio Silence. Yes. Fucking, it was such a blast. Yeah. I cannot state like overstate how cool they were to talk to and just so down to earth and I love them man and yeah. they also came from a YouTube background yeah. so they were really able to just understand the stuff that we go through yeah we talked a lot about just you know making low budget stuff and getting started making stuff and yeah so if you if you want to prep for that episode uh they did uh, a segment of VHS, the last one, and then they did a feature-length film called Devil's Do, and then they did the first segment of another anthological horror movie uh, called Southbound, mm-hmm. and then they did Ready or Not. That is their like feature film mm-hmm. filmography, and we talk about all of those things in turn, and like I-, I think it'd be useful and enlightening if you watch those, and then you got to really partake in that conversation where we go through how those things got made, how one led to another. It's a fun journey through the, this collective of dudes who like forged their own path mm-hmm. into Hollywood and uh, th- like I wouldn't even say they're Hollywood they're just making movies that they want to make mm-hmm. and I'm so glad they found such a uh, big success with Ready or Not yeah it sounds like they were really I think they're surprised by it too yeah it sounds like they're like made something they're like 
it, it's it's what they've been wanting to do this whole time. They nailed it with Ready or Not, and I'm so happy for them, man. Yeah. So cool. So definitely tune in next week for that. Uh, a lot of fun. Follow us on social media on Dead Meat at Dead Meat James on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Carebeck, C-A-R-E-B-E-C-C on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want merch, deadmeatstore.com. Mm-hmm. And feel free to email deadmeatpod at gmail.com with any questions or comments. Also, if you still haven't gotten the In Search of Darkness documentary, uh, go ahead and email me at Dead Meat James. We have nothing to do with the distribution, yeah. but I can forward <laughs> you to another email address. Uh yeah, sorry. I know that some people haven't gotten it, so hopefully you will get that soon. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, until next time, I'm James. I'm Chelsea. And this has been the Dead Me Podcast. Mm-hmm.